All right, welcome to the Nature Journal Show Live. I'm about to show you how to nature journal from your window. It's kind of rainy outside, and I thought today would be the perfect day to show you how to set up a little station so you can just sit in the comfort of your home and nature journal right out your window. First, I'm gonna do a couple things of gratitude, and this is something that I've talked about in mindset journaling before, but I just wanted to do it because I was feeling a little bit down today, to tell you the truth, and I easily could have procrastinated doing this Nature Journal live show and just sat around watching some Netflix to deal with my depression, or I could have just eaten a brownie, which I might do anyways. I could have just eat some dark chocolate, which I will definitely do anyways, but one thing that works even better than those and works even better than drinking a snifter full of brandy is to do some gratitude. So I'm gonna start off with these pens that I just got in the mail and I'm super grateful for these. You've probably seen me talk about these before, but these are the amazing Fude pins. I believe they are the Fude um, Pilot Fude Yako double-sided pins and these things are awesome. Unfortunately, the ink does run out kind of quickly, especially on the gray side, and I use the gray side so much that it runs out, but I just am grateful for these and grateful that someone invented gray ink because gray ink is amazing for nature journaling, and being able to have that hierarchy of two colors of ink is super useful, so I'm grateful for that. And just going through and saying what you're grateful for, if you want, write what you're grateful for in your journal. I know that some people um, have issues maybe starting a nature journal session. If you're feeling um, like down or depressed, it's happening to a lot of people right now. Don't stigmatize yourself. It's, it's, you know, it's normal. It's natural. But practicing gratitude, writing down what you're grateful for is going to really help. Another thing I'm grateful for and a person that I'm grateful for is Lori Line. Um, she watches a lot of my YouTube videos. I know she's been spending a lot of time on Zoom lately, so she hasn't been spending as much time watching videos on YouTube because she's trying to balance out her online life. But Lori sent me a whole bunch of these zebra pins. I did a review about these. Um, you can see it on my YouTube channel. And I did a review about all these different zebra pins. John Muir Laws is the one that – John Muir Laws and Ache told me about these. Um, JP probably told me something too. Um, but these are really cool, and Lori sent me a bunch of those, so grateful for Lori Line. And I know even though she's not at participating as much in the, the chat and everything like that on the premieres, I'm really grateful for her and know that she supports a lot of the work that I'm doing. Also, just want to give a shout-out and um, share my gratitude for Eli. Um, Eli sent me this uh really cool preppy fountain pen. I've used it a little bit, but need to use it more, and some of these cartridges that I need to experiment with more. So grateful for him and everybody who watches my videos. You all have been super, um, super helpful this year, and just, just knowing that there's a community of people that are super excited about nature journaling and watching these videos has helped me a lot. So just by sharing that gratitude, uh, that is something that can help your mood so much. And so now that I've done that, I'm going to get into the nature journaling. I've got my setup here, so it's a little bit sketchy. I'm right on uh, a bunch of stairs here at my house, but I have this window that's perfect. I have a document camera that I'm going to set up so you can watch me as I do my pages. I'm going to set this in the windowsill here. Hopefully, my laptop won't fall down the, down the stairs. Hopefully, I won't fall down the stairs. I also have this chicken broth. You might be wondering what that's for. That's actually for a weight um, to hold the document camera in place. And so luckily, my window doesn't have a screen. So that allows this really, whoa, my document camera did fall down the stairs. But if you don't have a screen or you can take your screen off, that allows you to set up um, your journal page uh, more easily there. You can see some of the journaling I did yesterday. That's going to be for an upcoming video. Looking forward to that one. And the next important thing is to have like a, a chair that you can sit in really easily and have all of your nature journal supplies. Some people have been asking me about my supplies lately, so I might talk a little bit more about that. But first I'm going to get set up here to nature journal from my windowsill. It has a lot of advantages. Let's see here. So for example, right now it's raining outside and I can 
even if it's raining pretty hard, I can start moving in a little bit from the window and still get some good nature journaling in, which I would not be able to do that outside on a day like today. And um, this is an idea that I started doing when I was trying to nature journal every single day last year in the fall, I think that was. And I found that before I committed to nature journaling every single day, I, um, I never nature journaled at home. I would always go somewhere special, special to nature journal. And I found that nature journaling every day forced me to nature journal sometimes at home because I would get off work and maybe I wouldn't have time to go somewhere special. So realizing that nature journaling turns your backyard into special is one of the biggest and best things that I've learned um, through nature journaling. And so that was when I first started nature journaling from my windowsill and it turned out to be amazing. Even just 15 or 20 minutes was great. So if you can find a spot at home, um, being at a nature journal from your windowsill is just beneficial in that way. Accessibility, it's good when there's weather, weather constraints and it's also good if for whatever reason, other reasons you can't get outside. So once you have kind of your setup, like start experimenting with what works well for you, then start paying attention and definitely have binoculars. So I've had really cool um, bird experiences from my window. One thing you could do is have a feeder. That would be a great idea. I used to have a hummingbird feeder right here and I got some really great close up drawings of hummingbirds coming in to feed. Um, but even if you don't have a feeder, it's okay. You'll probably be able to see birds from your window and I'm hoping to see some of those today. I also have a lot of plants that I can see out my window and having binoculars is good. One thing I recommend is not pointing your binoculars into your neighbor's houses because um, if people see you, you know, pointing binoculars at their houses, they might get kind of weirded out. So I've got my bulldog clips here. If you've watched my videos before or know me, you know that I love these things. They're one of the best tools ever, especially if you're using a lot of watercolor or you're in windy conditions. All right, so I'm gonna just get set up here and I'm gonna do my metadata first. I love using my gray pen for metadata. And that reminds me to point something out. Um, when you are using new materials and old materials of the same type, so for example, with these Fudoyaku brushes, um, I will have a new one and I'll have an old one. The old one runs out of the gray ink but still has black ink. Putting some type of marker on those so you know which one is old and which one is new is really useful. And this also helps with the water brushes. You might have noticed that the, you can tell the difference between these because one is like clearer. This one here on this side is newer. And what that means is that the water comes out a lot faster than this old one. So I put white tape on it so I know which one is which. And I'm gonna do that with uh, these pins as well. So in this case, I'm gonna put white on the new one that has gray in it so I don't waste time when I reach into my nature journal kit. Anything you can do to eliminate uh, that friction is what I call it. The friction is how long it takes you to pull a pencil out of your nature journal kit. If it takes you 30 seconds to pull a pencil out of your nature journal kit, that's too long. Or if it takes you 30 seconds to figure out which of your brush pins is the one that has gray ink in it, that's too long. So all of those things affect your nature journaling a lot and eliminating as much of that friction as possible is good. And this white tape can be a great way to um, mark things. I know the light isn't great right now, but mainly I want you to be able to see the outdoors. You can also have your snacks here, um, your glass of wine if you're an adult or whatever you want, like while you're sitting inside. That's one of the benefits of nature journaling out your window. So I'm gonna start with my metadata here and I love using my gray pen for that. Okay, so my metadata usually goes in a box up here at the top corner of the page. And if there's anything that you want to know or if you have any questions, post them in the comments. I think I can see comments on YouTube and on my personal Facebook page, but I can't see the comments on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page, unfortunately. Okay, so I'm just going to write the name of where I live, Gold Ridge, the road. 
Uh, maybe I'll switch to my document camera so you can see this whole process. Is that upside down? There we go. Cold Ridge, um, and it is rainy, so I'm gonna do like a cloud here. I don't have my thermometer with me, so I'm gonna guess that it's in the 50s, so approximately 54 degrees Fahrenheit. The humidity should be about 100% um, because it's raining. And um, today's date is one, is today the 25th? 24th. One twenty four, twenty twenty one. And I'm going to say light rain moving through through um, nature journaling from my window. Your window can end up being basically like your sit spot, which is really cool. If you don't have a sit spot already, your window can be this repeated place that you go back to um, above the garden. So your your sit spot is is powerful because it's, you keep observing nature in the same spot and you start to notice like individual birds, for example, and you start to learn so much more when you repeat it in the same same location. Okay, now I think what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to just kind of scan the area, see if I see any birds out there, and um, if there's anything like really exciting that's only happening for a short amount of time, I'll try nature journaling that first. If not, I'll start nature journaling a bird. I mean a plant. So if you nature journal a plant, then the cool thing is plants don't move, or most of them don't move very much, right? And so if you nature journal a plant, while you're nature journaling that plant, a lot of times the animals will come through. So they notice that you're focused on a plant or they just don't notice you because you're focused on a plant, you're still, you're not moving, um, or you're doing a landscape ito. I talk about this in that secret birding technique. If you're drawing a landscape ito or drawing a tree, the birds are likely to come closer to you. So I'm gonna start off drawing how about I draw this tobacco plant that I have in front of um, in front of my house? So you can see it right right there. That's a really big um, tobacco plant, and it has flowers on the top of it. This is like the best plant for hummingbirds, by the way. So I'm gonna start drawing the flowers on it. I've drawn this uh, flowers of this before in my how to draw flowers video. But I'm gonna start drawing the flowers of it, and hopefully while I'm drawing that maybe some um, birds will show up or something else will show up in the garden. So I'm gonna, I'll switch back to the document camera here. You can see the flowers on the top there, right above the, the horizon line, right there. So I'm gonna start drawing those on my page. So I'm gonna do a loose drawing and I'm gonna start immediately with ink um, because I, I just wanna go quickly. And I think I'll do this, um, you know, I'm not thinking too much about composition. I just wanna get some nature journaling in. So let's see, I am going to, yeah, just start here at the top, get a little bit of the leaf in, almost like a um, blind contour drawing here maybe for the leaves could be a little bit helpful to not get stuck and just get kind of warmed up. Okay, and then I can put some text in there. That'll look fine. Um, the main stem comes up here. And from the main stem, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like nine clusters of flowers. So the first cluster of flowers comes out here. There's several immature flowers. 
one mature flower. It's in the Solanaceae, so it has sort of like this five-point star thing going on. Kind of oversimplify that, but get that important thing. So if you watch my Botany Basics for Flower Drawing video that I mentioned earlier, you'll learn some of the things that are important. There's certain things that are okay for you to fudge or make up from your imagination when you draw a flower, but there's other things that are really important. So for this family, that five part symmetry is really critical. And you know, if you fudge the color of the flower a little bit, or you um, maybe get the inflorescence is not precise, um, that's okay, but that five part symmetry is really characteristic of this family. So um, that's one of the things you don't want to really make up. If anything, you want to exaggerate it a little bit, and that's what exactly what I'm doing right now. I see little droplets of water landing on my page because I'm kind of leaning out the window a little bit, but it's only drizzling, so that should be fine. Okay, and then there's one more sort of of these clusters here. There's several like major nature journaling approaches I could use um, right now. I could do the timeline, which shows a flower at different stages. That would keep me busy um, for a while. I could um, do a collection for my window, a collection. So I'll write these names down. So timeline, maybe you've done this before. A timeline is a great uh, nature journaling strategy where you would show a flower or a plant at different stages of maturity. And it's really good for things that um, have different stages. It's very similar to the, uh, another strategy called change over time, which you would actually come back at different points um, and look at the same flower, change over time. Many of you have probably heard of that one. So a timeline is similar to that, but you could do it all on one plant. So on this plant, you could find the immature buds, you could find ones that are partially starting to open, fully open one, and dead flowers all on the same plant, and that would be a timeline. Change over time would be if you watched one of these single flowers change over a period of time. So that would be one um, strategy. Another strategy I could do today would be a collection. These are some of the most common nature journaling strategies. Collection. Another one I'll mention for today for nature journaling from your window would just be a curiosity wander. And you're not gonna actually wander on your feet, literally, but your eyes will wander um, around your garden or around whatever, whatever area. It could be a vacant lot that you can see out your window. window. <laughs> whatever area you can see out your window, a curiosity wander would just be kind of taking it all in and following your curiosity and nature journaling, whatever captures your attention. And a lot of people, they do that one um, as their default nature journaling strategy. Another one we could do from our window would be the, um, the species profile. So I could do a mini species profile right now with this tobacco. Um, so for example, you know, and this is a species profile is when people think of nature journaling, a lot of people just end up doing species profile. A lot of botanical illustration is species profile. So species profile would be, you know, you draw the inflorescence with these flowers and you draw the leaves of the plant and then you show several other aspects of the plant and then you have like the Latin name of it. So this is, um, I think it's Nico, Nicociana, um, how do you say woolly in Latin? Nicotiana. Um, oh, I forget how to say woolly in Latin. But it's the um, it's called the Peruvian woolly tobacco. So I wouldn't put that in italics because that's not Latin. Peruvian. Um, woolly. Oh, I'm blanking on my Latin right now. Nicotiana. Um, it's not Nicotiana tobacco. That's the main tobacco variety. Nicotiana sylvestris, Nicotiana. Anyways, I'll look that up later. But a species profile would basically be, you know, you have this main drawing, sort of like a portrait. You have some information about it. Maybe you have like a close-up. So let me do a close-up here. I haven't been using circles lately, so maybe I'll try a circle. Who wants to see a circle? 
Okay, what should I use for tracing a circle? Whatever, I'll freehand it. Okay, so I'll freehand a circle here, and I'll just zoom in on the flower cluster. Maybe I'll make an arrow coming to it. These are all things you could do in a species profile from your window. Okay, in a circle. I really like the gray for these kind of compositional, structural elements, and then the black for my drawing. Don't get too precious early on, right? If you get too precious, Glauca, oh, Andrew. Uh, Glauca, um, I mean, I think pubescens might actually be woolly in Latin, but that's not this one. It, Nicociana Glauca, no, I think it's, I don't think that's it. Um, but yeah, Glauca is, 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 another, is another species name for sure in a Latin word in a lot of plant names. Um, thanks, Andrew. Glad you're on here. Andrew was really awesome. Let me just, I was doing that gratitude thing earlier. Um, and let me just give a little gratitude to Andrew because he hooked me up with some really cool opportunities while I was in San Diego. Um, Andrew, you're awesome. Andrew, he works down in San Diego at the Cabrillo National Monument, like a really cool biodiverse um, area with a lot of endemic species. And he hooked me up while I was in San Diego. Uh, the drawings aren't in this journal right here. They're, they're in a journal that I just finished, but he showed me a bunch of cool plants and cool stuff going on at Cabrillo National Monument. If you live in San Diego, Cabrillo National Monument is a great place in Nature Journal. So just shout, a little gra gratitude shout out for Andrew Rosales. Um, super awesome guy, super knowledgeable, works out there at that um, Cabrillo National Monument. Really fun spot to Nature Journal. Um, thanks, Andrew. Okay, so, um, but I'll look up the Latin name later, Nicociana, I can't remember the, the, the species name. Anyways, I'm going to zoom in now. I'm going to use my binoculars. I've got my close focus binoculars here, of course. Um, so I'm going to zoom in with those and look at one of the flower structures and just get that drawing into here. And that starts building up my page. So you can see that compositionally my page is already almost like half full. Um, and I'm just going to keep adding elements, nature drilling for my window since it's raining outside. Oh, Tomentosa, that might be it too. Nicociana Tomentosa. Tomentosa, I think, does mean, mean woolly, um, but I don't know if that's the name of the species. The, the Latin names do get rather confusing. It's almost time to eat some chocolate. Save that here for later. Okay. Zoom in on the flowers. Focus, Marley, focus. One thing about nature journaling from your window, it's it's like nature journaling at home or drawing at home, doing art at home. It's way easier to get distracted. I'm gonna draw that one that's facing that way. So you know when you have when when you have your kitchen right nearby, you could easily go stop nature journaling and make some tea. And uh, that's distracting. You could have other family members in your house. That could be distracting. So there's definitely downsides to nature journaling from your window. A lot of people make better art when they're separated from their normal environment. And um, when you are so close to your normal environment, like you are when you're at your windowsill, it can be distracting. The chocolate's nearby. The coffee is nearby, the screaming children or a screaming spouse is nearby, and all of those things can distract you from nature journaling. Okay, so I've got sort of this one that's about to open, this one that's already opened, um, and these ones are facing sideways, which is fine. If I want to get really technical, I would probably want to draw one face on. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to switch cameras in a second to show you my binocular drawing technique. And I did a whole video about this that some of you have probably seen. It's called How to Draw with Binoculars. Um, there's no one else has made a video about that on YouTube. There's a lot on how to draw like binoculars, like to draw, if you wanted to draw your binoculars. I don't know why you would really want to do that, but 
these close focus ones are light. So the, the technique I prefer is to use a technique where I can look through my binoculars this way and then look at my drawing without moving the binoculars. The other method would be to alternate between looking through the binoculars and looking at your drawing. I have a whole video about this that you can look up, but um, I'm just gonna show you right now. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find my subject. So I found my flower. I focused up here with the, this is the focus dial. Get that focused in and then you don't have to change that. Now, if you might be able to see this, but I'm holding the binoculars against like my brow bone right here and angling them sort of up like this. So I'm not totally suction cupping them right onto my eyeballs. I'm holding them up a little bit so I can look through them, but I also have this gap down here that I can look at my paper with. Um, and you can do this when you're sitting, when you're drawing birds. If you struggle looking through binoculars and drawing, this technique will help you a lot because you can just look down and look up. All you have to do is move your eyeballs and keep your pin in the same place. So I found my flower cluster that I want to draw. I'm looking at that. Okay, I'm noticing some details. These are the immature flowers. Um, now I'm drawing. Okay, now I'm looking again. Now I'm looking at my drawing. Now I'm looking at the flower again. Now I'm looking at my drawing. And you can even sometimes move your pen or pencil um, while you're drawing, while your eyes are still looking at the thing through the binoculars. And the other ways of looking through binoculars and alternating, you can't do this. You have to rely on your working memory. And that's a lot harder. Our visual memory is not that strong. So one of the things I'm noticing while I do this is that there's these sort of side leaves on the flower, which are really interesting. Um, but that's a side view of the flower, all right? Side view of flower. And you saw how I did my, um, okay, one warning. John Laws warns about this in, the, your, in his book, but see how I'm holding my binoculars and my open pin right here? So if I go like this really quickly and bring my binoculars back up, I could easily poke my pin into my eyeball or at least get like um, a tattooed eye eyebrows. I might get tattooed eyebrows someday when I'm older, but I don't want to do that quite yet. So if, if you don't want to do that quite yet, don't hold your open pin or pencil or just get in the practice of not holding your pen and pencil in the same hand that you hold your binoculars. So I'd recommend using your non-dominant hand exclusively for your binoculars and your dominant hand exclusively for your drawing tools. All right, so you can see I've got this side view, all right, side view. At this point, my page is mostly a species profile. At this point, I mostly have done a species profile. Um, side view. Maybe side view is not necessary to write because it's kind of obvious. Maybe I'll do a double line around this. I don't usually use circles in my composition. Bella Perennis on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page uses circles really well. I interviewed her. She started, or she, she co runs a Nature Journal German language group. And she uses circles really well in her botanical art. Um, it sounds like some people thought the, the eyebrow tattoos is a really good idea. I'm glad. I think I might do a front view of the flowers um, because the side view doesn't show all the Solanaceae characteristics. So what I have to do now is use my binoculars and look outside and find one that is forward facing. Okay, here we go. I found one. All right, I'm going to draw that one now. Getting plant flowers from multiple angles is obviously really important. Like in a species profile, if you think about all of these, um, you know, artists, Victorian artists who drew plants, they would always draw it from multiple perspectives. So trying to get this symmetry, this five-part symmetry is characteristic of this whole family. Lots of interesting plants in this family. Whoa, that's not totally symmetrical, but 
at least I got the Pentagon kind of, and it looks like there's two, it almost looks like there's two stigmas. Is that right? No, there's more than that. Or are those the anthers? Okay, I'm starting to forget my stolen ACA botany right now, but um, there's this, at least one that I can see, two that I can see. And then there's some of these that don't have anything. I think those are, can't, I'm not sure if those are the male parts or the female parts from this perspective. And there's kind of a general circle. A lot of times from the front of a flower, we, we over exaggerate this circle and you usually can't actually see that when you're looking into the flower. So I'm going to rely a lot on color on this one, I think, because the color, there is a color transition from pink to pale white um, that I think will be more obvious. And I'll write front view. So basically at this point, I've done a species profile. Now would be a good time to soften my eyeballs. My eyeballs are very focused. Um, so I've been focusing on looking through my, uh, looking through my binoculars and looking at a small drawing. So now I want to zoom out a little bit and see if I can see some other stuff. Okay. So I've been zooming in a lot and just looking at the small, small drawings and gluing my eyeballs into my binoculars, but there could be other things happening outside of my window that I haven't been paying attention to. Also, I'm talking kind of loud. So slowing down a little bit, I ate my chocolate already, slowing down a little bit and just kind of scanning the area and paying attention. A lot of times what we normally do when we look out our window is we just kind of look at everything and maybe we're like dialing into nature, kind of like connecting with nature. But what usually happens is after like two microseconds of connecting with nature, your mind starts ruminating about other subjects. And so nature journaling helps keep you focused on the nature. And a lot of times I've gone into this discussion with people about like, oh, well, nature journaling is so analytical and that's like separating you from nature and like you're thinking about like what you're putting on your paper and all of that. But I'm starting to think that it's that's not true. And unless you're like some kind of like amazing Zen monk, you're probably not really capable of connecting with nature for more than a couple microseconds before you start ruminating about other things like what you're gonna eat for dinner, what some so and so said about you, how you feel about what happened two days ago, the comeback line that you should have had to respond to something someone insulted you with, like a week ago, all of those things get in the way. And so nature journaling is a way to keep looking at it. Like this whole time I've been making this video, I haven't been ruminating about all, any of those things. So now what I'm gonna do is I am gonna uh, stop nature journaling for a second and just kind of scan around, um, see what I see outside and see if there's any like animals because it would be cool to add an animal here. Or maybe I could add, another thing you can do is um, add timestamps. Ooh, I didn't do that when I started, but I know I started my video at 2.45. So in my metadata, I should definitely write 2.45. And then one really cool nature journaling technique that you can do is just use timestamps. So right now it is now 3.18. So over here I could write 3.18. And maybe I'll put that like in a little cloud bubble. And then I'll do like an update on the weather. So. Let's see what's happening with the weather. It's sort of just drizzling. It's barely drizzling now. It was raining more before. Using these timestamps is a super easy technique. I don't know what the strategy would be for that one, but I'm just going to write timestamps here. No matter what strategy you're using, uh, as you go on the page, there's a chronology to it. And sometimes that's unrecognized. So if you just have this whole page full of drawings, like let me show you mine from yesterday. If you have a whole page full of drawings, there's this sort of, I mean, even though the, the reader or the viewer is gonna look at this in a chronological order, there's no timestamps on here. So you, as the viewer or the reader, have no idea when these things happened in relationship to each other. You just have this one um, timestamp in the metadata. So if you're on like a trip, 
um, or you're in the woods or going for a hike or going mushroom hunting or something like that or going birding and you're nature journaling, just by using these timestamps every once in a while, it gives a sort of chronological order to your page and adds so much more information. And that's really critical information too. So I'm adding that little timestamp. It's 318. It's barely drizzling now. And I'm going to just kind of scan around, see if I can find yesterday or no, like last week I saw a Cooper's Hawk in my garden. So I'm going to just kind of scan around. Um, whoa, almost got that tattoo situation going on again. Let me put that down. See what else I can see in my yard. Um, binoculars usually aren't the best thing for scanning. So what I recommend is um, scanning without the monoculars, kind of moving your eyes around, and then every once in a while, use the binoculars if you're not sure of something or you want to look closer, like into a bush or whatever. There were a lot of birds before out here, but I'm not seeing them now. Um, I can see, there are some mushrooms I can see from here. Oh, and I can see a calla lily, that's kind of cool. So that would be another flower if I want to continue on the collection theme. There's some horse tails that I could draw. Oh, I see a um, some type of Asteraceae flower. I see miner's lettuce. What else can I see from here? And I also can see sort of the general landscape um, looking out across the valley, which might be worthwhile to draw. What else? I can look at my vegetables in my garden. Oh, I see another, I think I'm gonna do a flower collection because I'm seeing a lot of different flowers blooming for the time of year, which is kind of interesting because it's, it's winter, right? But I'm gonna go ahead and start um, doing it as if I'm doing a collection. So I mentioned collection as one of these major nature journaling strategies. And I'm gonna go ahead and um, use that one for my window drawing. So I've got, this um, tobacco, which I'm going to look up, it's um, uh, Nicotiana something something, and I've got the genus name, but I'll add the species name later, and now I'm going to go ahead and just see if I can add a couple other flowers in here, and composition-wise, I think that'll work. So I will switch over to my other camera so you can see my paper more close up. And it might be almost time to... Bust out the brownie in a bowl. Brownies are really good for nature journaling because they have lots of essential nutrients. And it's usually best if you eat them when you're done nature journaling because then it's like a reward. But sometimes it's good to eat them while you're nature journaling too. But you have to watch out for these little, these little bits of chocolate can really mess up your watercolor. If you're nature journaling from your window, another thing you could do would be to every once in a while run outside and like pick up some objects and then bring those back in and I could have like a leaf or I could pick one of these flowers and draw it close up. So now I've got this one other flower I'm going to look at through my binoculars and try to draw that. And first thing I can do is think a little bit about the composition. I think composition is really important. Um, so I've got these, you can see, ooh, you can see how the raindrops are affecting some of my lettering up here. So as much as I love these pens, the gray ink is a little bit more water soluble than the black ink. And you can see how when the little raindrops hit it, it kind of messes it up. I'm not too worried about that at this moment, but if it starts to rain more, I'll do something about it. So... I'm going to put in another line here to create sort of another box. I'm going with a little bit of rule of thirds here. So I'm going to make this box bigger than my last one. So this right here is a little bit less than half of the page. So I'm going to make this down here a little bit more than half of the page. Does that make sense? And that way I'm not just dividing my page straight in half. But you have to balance your, you know, those sort of compositional design ideas with 
your subject matter. So if I decide, okay, this one little flower that has hard, I hardly have any information about should go in here, that's problematic. Like maybe the tobacco should have gone in here and the one little flower that I have hardly any inf information about should have gone into this smaller box. So balancing between a uh, composition and the needs of the subject is really important. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make sure that my, um, that the, the next thing I choose, oh yeah, there's the Mexican marigold. That's Asteraceae, right, to, to GD. So there's this other plant out in my garden that is flowering right now, that's Asteraceae. It's a little bit further away, but it's a lot bigger and I can get a lot more information about it. It will fit better into this box. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna go ahead and put in, I know the species name, so I'll put in, I'll think about, okay, well, I want species name at the top. I got that species name at the top, so I'll put species at the top here too. It's Tegetes. The cool thing about, the reason why you use Latin for plant names and animal names is because you can pronounce it any way that you want. Um, most people that I know, they just pronounce it the way that their professor or teacher um, did, and so it's kind of funny. Um, but this one is Tegetes lucida. I would think that the uh, Romance languages pronunciation of Latin would probably be more accurate than, you know, like the English pronunciation of Latin, but I'm not sure, especially with vowels, for example, it's a little bit confusing. Anyways, that's sort of a side topic. So I'm going to look through my binoculars and try to um, draw um, some aspects of this plant. So first I'm going to try to get the overall um, kind of feeling of that plant. And let's see if I could even show it to you with my document camera. So there's a plant out there um, above those white posts. It's kind of dark. So out there, there's a plant with yellow leaves and it's forming that whole bush right there. And I'm going to see if I can get the feeling of the whole bush before I zoom in on any of the um, individual flowers. And it's in the marigold genus. Tegetes is the marigold genus. Um, and this one is a perennial. Most of the wild ones and original species are perennial and they've been bred for bigger flowers and less perennial nature and more less resilient. So right here, I'm gonna, in this small area here, I'm gonna try to show the whole bush. So just, I'm going to kind of keep it simple and maybe just symbolize foliage with these sort of marks here and the foliage. I think they come out at opposite, um, opposite leaves. Yeah. Opposite leaves. So opposite leaves, that's the kind of thing you don't want to make up. So right now I'm doing a quick kind of semblance of a plant. And a lot of times when you're drawing, I mean, always when you're drawing, you have to simplify things. You can't show everything that is in real life. You can't, it's just impossible. But knowing a little bit about botany will let you know which are the things you can fake and which are the things you have to get a certain way. And so opposite leaves is super important. Are the leaves opposite or are they alternate? And if you get that wrong for this plant, then you, it's not identifiable as this plant. Like a real botanist or someone who knows about botany sees that those leaves aren't opposite and they will not, they'll immediately disqualify um, Tegetes as one of the possible plants that this could, this drawing could represent. So you have to get that right. There's other things you could fudge. For example, like leaf shape it doesn't need to be perfect. I can, I can symbolize the leaf shape with these simple black lines. The color, the color doesn't need to be perfect. I'm not even gonna use color in this drawing, except for the flowers maybe. And the flower shape even is not super important in this particular drawing. But if I, if I, if I made these leaves alternate instead of opposite, like instead of them coming out on opposite sides of the, the stock, making them come out alternatingly on the stock, that would totally ruin it. So knowing a little bit about what you're drawing is really important. I'm gonna just draw some grass or some ground here to kind of give it this. And then I'm gonna say like a little bit of quantification. It's probably like four, four and a half feet tall. 
0.5 foot tall. Um, I'm going to call it an herbaceous bush. It's not that woody, but it is kind of bushy. And it is perennial. Because we're in winter right now, and it even has flowers on it, even though we've gotten some frosts. Okay, so that kind of gives the overall view of the plant. And then I'll do a zooming in section, just like I did on the last one. And if you follow your similar, if you have consistency, so like if I use the same system I did here for the zooming in of the flowers for this plant, and if I use the same system here, I probably should have put the common name above the Latin name as I did here, but having a consistency with how you do that, you know, don't worry about it too much at first, but if you've been nature journaling for a couple of years, Figuring out like a consistent system for how you do things like this is just going to make your pages so, so much more legible. All right, so now I'm going to go, um, doo -doo -doo, and I'll use a circle again because I did a circle last time. A double circle, in fact. It's okay if it goes off of this square a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfect, but consistent is good. Okay, now I'm gonna zoom in. And this is harder because these flowers are way further away. Maybe I should run out there and pick one. Um, but then you'd have to sit there and watch me run out into the wet garden and pick one of these barefoot. Um, so I think I'm just gonna try to draw it from here. Ah, they're so far away. Okay, so on my last one, I did a side view and a front view. So I should probably do something. I see Jose Jimenez is on here. Gracias, Jose. Jose is part of the Spanish language nature journal club and it has started a nature journal club in Patagonia in Argentina. Super awesome. I can't wait to go down there and nature journal with him someday. Okay. If you speak Spanish, check that club out. Or if you want to learn Spanish, check it out. Or if you know anyone else who might want to start nature journaling and as a Spanish speaker, um, they can check that one out too on Facebook. Okay, so let's see. Man, these flowers are really far away. I'm not getting that good of a, um, I can't zoom in on them that well. Um, but they're in clusters, so may, let me just try. Okay, so here there's this sort of the the disc flowers and the ray flowers because this is, I mean, is it Asteraceae? Yeah, it's, it, are the marigolds Asteraceae? Dang, now I'm starting to doubt myself about that. Marigolds, Asteraceae, they almost seem like Lamiaceae in some ways, but the flowers don't. They look like classic Aster sunflower family flowers. It's so interesting. And they're all yellow. They have the discs, they have the rays. Let me see how many I can count in one of the clusters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two. I could do a stem leaf plot here if I wanted to. Um, so let's see, clusters. Or inflorescence. And one, some, let's see, I got one that was, I got two, I got, um, this isn't going to be a stem leaf plot, but two, seven, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. This is the number of flowers I'm plant counting in each little cluster. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Okay, and in this drawing, I have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and then I almost feel like I need to get a closer picture, closer flower to actually draw it better, but I'm gonna do some color now. Susan is watching. Oh, Susan's doing journaling from her window too. That's awesome. Nice job, Susan. Uh, would love to see some pages of your window sill nature journaling. I'm gonna add some color right now, so I'm gonna get my watercolor out. Maybe I'll switch cameras while I do that.
Okay, don't drop your watercolor palette out the window. That would be bad. So, I also have to be careful not to fall down the stairs because there's a whole bunch of stairs right here below me. That would be bad. And I'm gonna go in here, whenever you're doing um, watercolor and you have multiple things to, ready to go on your page, you can kind of batch your watercolor. So if you have to do greens, do the greens on all of your plants. If you have to do yellows or other warm colors, do all of them all at once. And that will that will save you time um, cleaning brushes. Um, but regardless, um, have something to wipe your brush on, like your old sock or your paper towel or whatever. And I'm going to start with my yellows because that's one of the easiest colors to get all dirty. And um, the main thing I have is the GD's Lucida, that Mexican marigold. It's also called mint marigold for some reason. So I'm going to put in the yellow there. If I had the other close-up flower, I would do it. Um, now that I put in the yellow, you can't even see this, um, so maybe I'll switch back to the other one. So put in my yellow um, for those, and there's a, almost a little bit of yellow in these um, Nicotiana flowers, like in this part, and kind of like a teeny bit there, but it's like really light. So let me come in with a wet brush with no pigment and kind of lighten that. Um, and then maybe do the back of these a little bit. And then now I'm going to come in with that pink. So there's a pink color. I'm going to go straight for my most saturated pink, with, which is the quinacridone. But I want to water it down quite a bit. And then come in here and do these. Um, you can do these while they're still wet on wet and fade it into that yellow. But these Nicotianas have a pink flower. Um, and it starts more pink. The, most of the pink is near the edge of the petal. Um, it's a Corolla actually, so a Corolla, not the Toyota Corolla, but a Corolla is fused petals. So when a flower has petals that are all fused together, like a honeysuckle or a tobacco, um, that's called a Corolla. I think sometimes when they come up with new cars, they have to come up with a name for them and they just start like looking through like a botanical dictionary or whatever, and they're like, ooh, Corolla. Most people have no idea what that means, and it sounds kind of nice and um, submissive or something. I don't know. And then they're like, let's make that the name of our car. Okay, so I got that color in there. Um, got the color in there. That's probably enough. Maybe I'll put a little bit more saturated near the edge while it's still kind of wet. Whoa, that's really saturated, but... Um, it's still wet, so I can work with it. So this is, watch how I save this here. Famous last words. Okay, so I'm going to put that in while it's still really wet, and then hopefully, it's not really wet, but it's wet enough. Um, so now I'm going to clean my brush. Clean my brush on my paper towel here real quick. Can you even see my paper towel? Get it so it's just a wet brush, no pigment, or almost no pigment, and then come back in here and fudge that line because you don't want that strong line. It's still a little bit too um, saturated, lipsticky kind of color, but I think that'll work. See how I did that? Watercolor is amazing. It's not as hard as you think. Now I'm going to make my greens, and I think I'm going to use mostly the Serpentine Genuine. Oh my gosh, I need to replace that color. Look how I'm almost running out of it. So it gets some Serpentine Genuine. Notice how this one doesn't come out as strong white right away. Um, I definitely need to get more and try not to water it down too much. This is going to be the base for all of my greens. It's already toned and it's already more on the yellow side, which I find a lot of foliage where I live is, is more like that. If you start with one of those really saturated greens like Hooker's Green or something like that, um, you're going to end up with two saturated of greens all the time. So that's why I run out of the Serpentine Genuine so fast. Um, and if I were to re reinvent this palette, I might eliminate the Hooker's Green. I almost never use that Hooker's Green. It's so saturated. Okay. See, I can get that tobacco foliage color just with that one green without even mixing. And that's one of the things I love about 
this um, palette from John Muir Laws. And I know these, I'm pretty sure these are available on his website again. Um, but if I don't have to spend 30 seconds to two minutes um, mixing a color, that just saves me so much time in the field. And right now I'm going to show you how you can kind of just put a little bit of watercolor over this um, ink drawing, ink line drawing, and give it the semblance of green. And like, geez, that's already almost like a complete page right there. So you can see that I think that I've been doing this for about 30 minutes. You can see that in 30 minutes, you could probably come up, you could probably come up with a pretty legit nature journal page um, from your window in just 30 minutes. And I'm going to add some more writing and do a little bit more research. I think I'm going to go pick some of these Tajidius flowers. But you can see that in just about 30 minutes of nature journaling from your window, you can get in a pretty good session. And also, you know, if you start with that like gratitude that I was talking about, you can scientifically proven, in a scientifically proven way, enhance your mood without watching Netflix and without eating a brownie. Well, I ate the brownie, but that's not necessary. But doing, doing a little bit of gratitude, even writing it down, doing your windowsill journaling in 20 minutes, that would be an awesome practice. So if you want to stick along for the rest of this video, I'm going to run out there and pick some of these flowers, and then I'm going to do a little bit more. But if you just want to get a little bit of tidbit this Sunday afternoon, that is great. And you know that the Nature Journal show comes out every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And sometimes, special sometimes, I do these Sunday episodes. So stick around if you want to watch the rest of this one. I'm going to go out there and pick these flowers and come back and finish this windowsill nature journaling page. Let me see if there's any other comments here from people. Um... Nothing new. Suzanne is on here. Abdullah Mona is on here. Andrew was on here earlier. So I'm going to go, um, I'm going to eat a little bit more of this brownie. I'm going to pick some flowers. Um, come back and do a little bit more. No, not a special brownie. This is just a regular brownie. Um, so I'm going to go pick this flower. I'm going to switch cameras so you can see me run out there and pick it. If you want to, if you're nature journaling at home, nature journal some while I'm picking these flowers, or you can post some questions, any questions that you have while I'm picking the flowers, and then I'm going to do a close-up of the flowers, okay? It's not raining anymore, so I probably won't get rained on while I run out there. I'll be right back.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's awesome. So I am really lucky because I have a lot of cool stuff growing in my garden. And that means that even if I'm trying to do some nature journaling for my windowsill and it stops raining for a second, I can run outside and find lots of cool stuff. So for example, I did pick the flowers that I was talking about, the marigold flowers right here. And there was also two other types, no, three other types of Asteraceae. So three other flowers in that family blooming in my garden right now, even though it's January. So I got three um, Asteraceae, also some Borage, Boraginaceae, and a mushroom. So lots of cool things in Nature Journal. And this weird, what the heck, look at this weird squash that I found in my garden. Um, so... Lots of cool options that I can bring inside. No matter how bad the weather is, you can run outside for a few seconds and find some things to nature journal. So now it's just a matter of choosing. Ah, the mushroom is already breaking. Hopefully I won't forget that it's there. It will get guillotined when I close the windowsill. So I'm going to start with this one. Nature is distracting, so find that balance between noticing different new things and focusing on the thing you said you were going to focus on. Um, it's a good time for practicing self-awareness. So as you know already, oh, one thing to be careful of is some of these window sills. A lot of people have window sills with these different like materials here. They can sometimes have like dust or things on them that will stain your page. So when you put your journal down like this, it could get messed up. So be careful of that. Let's get this um, exposure good here. So what I'm going to do is, you can see I started the overall version of the plant, and now I'm going to try to get the um, the zoomed in version now that I have the flower here. And I had some questions about what family it was in. Even if you think you know your plant families, or you think you know your birds or whatever, it's really good to practice what I call like percentages of certainty. So instead of just saying, oh, that's in the... Asteraceae, I know it, or that's a Cooper's hawk. You could say, well, it, it, I think it is, or I'm 50% sure, or something like that. Or like with Cooper's hawks and sharp shinned hawks, what I do a lot of times is I say, oh, I think, or I know it's an occipiter, so I at least know what genus it's in, even if I don't know which species it is in. So practicing that is really useful because once you think you know something, you are very susceptible to um, very susceptible to confirmation bias. So watch out for that. Ooh, I see lots of um, comments. That's great. Um, so Mona says uh, all brownies are special. That's true. And Aneta, or, uh, Aneta, I don't know how to pronounce your name, so I'm sorry. Maybe it's Anietta, um, but. Glad that you, you made it um, for today. Jose is asking, ¿Es obligatorio un brownie al observar por la ventana? Yo diría que no, pero sí ayuda bastante. Tal vez una galleta o cualquier chocolate sí ayuda. Good question, Jose. Um, Susanna is asking if that's my garden. Yes. Someone recognized the tromboncino squash, even though it is a slightly underdeveloped tromboncino squash I would say it is one of my favorite types of squash so these can be really really big it's a great type of squash this one didn't fully mature oh it's kind of squishy there so it might not be good but a cool thing about squashes like this is this whole part here is seedless so it's really easy to cook and it's also all going to be like a similar size when you chop it up um, my favorite herbaceous plant family, in case you didn't know. Uh, I wish I knew who that Facebook user was, but I can't see your name. 
um, because of the way StreamYard works. So um, I'm glad Suzanne's still hanging out for this show. All right, so now let's get into the nitty picky of this flower, all right? So what distinguishes the Asteraceae? Well, it used to be called the, com um, com what was it? The um, uh, Compositae uh, because it's a composite flower. So there's multiple flowers combined into one. What? What do you mean by that, Marley? Well, if you look closely here, you'll notice that even as I pull off this single petal, hopefully it will work. As I pull off this single petal, if you look at that closely, you'll notice that there's reproductive parts attached to that single petal. And in fact, each one of these is a flower. So that is a flower. Can you see that? That is one flower. And this is one flower. Um, that's how sunflowers and all of those work. So those ones right there, those are called ray flowers because they're attached to a petal. But then you can see here in the middle, see all of those things that look sort of like weird curled up wise? Each one of those is a flower. And those are the disc flowers that make that up. So to me, it looks like there's probably at least 50 in there in the middle. Um, and that's one of the main things that identifies it as the Asteraceae. And the other examples that I had, you know, dandelions are in this family. Here's a calendula. Calendula is in that family. See how there's all of these little things in here? What? You never paid attention to those before? What about sunflowers? You know how sunflowers have lots of different seeds? Each one of those seeds is from a separate flower. So this right here is not a flower. It's a whole bunch of flowers all combined into one. Ooh, look how the petal went flying when I did it. Um, so this is not one flower. There's 50 or more flowers all combined into this one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in a little bit closely and draw draw one of those zoomed in. So you can see I have several stages of zoomed in. Here I have um, this stage showing the whole plant. I have sort of this right here showing the cluster. Maybe I'll add a little foliage to that. And then I'll do one really zoomed in. I wish you could smell this right now. Can, woo, that was a little bit too strong. This is a strong smelling um, flower. Actually, it's not the flower that smells, it's the foliage. And marigolds are really interesting. A lot of them are used for medicinal purposes. Um, some of them have been used for pesticides. Some of them kill nematodes in the soil. So it's a very um, powerful plant in that way. Let me get a little bit of this foliage. A lot of people who don't know botany or don't know that much about plants, they focus a lot on leaf and leaf shape. And leaf and leaf shape is not really usually a very useful characteristic for identifying plants or plant families. Even on one plant, you can often find leaves that are extremely variable and they're not closely connected with um, taxonomy or the, the relationships of these plants. That's why Linnaeus discovered early on in the naming of, um, in creating this binomial nomenclature for plants is that looking at the reproductive parts, so the flowers, is a lot more useful um, Oh, it sounds like that's Linda on Facebook. Hey, Linda, good to see you. Thanks for joining in for a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going to zoom in. I got a little bit of the foliage here in the drawing. Now I'm going to zoom in more closely. And I couldn't do this when I was looking through my binoculars before. So see, there's this long stem part that's really straight. And it comes up here. Maybe that's the ovary, sort of, or the ovaries. Then I've got these ray flowers or petals coming out here. Some of them overlap and some of them also have an important notch there on some of the Asteraceae, that's an important feature. Um, here, it's just kind of coming down here, there's sort of a dead petal. A lot of times we only want to draw the perfect parts of the flower, but there's often very many imperfect parts. And then there's all these little curvy things that come up and I probably can't get all the details, so. Um, I'll just kind of get the overall shape. I that looks weird. 
It's fine. Once I put the color on, it'll fix everything. Just put yellow over all of that, and it'll look good. Okay. Um, so this is the this is the cluster. This is one of those um, inflorescence. This one isn't. Oh, so Andrew Rosales is asking if this is Mexican tarragon. This isn't. Oh shoot. Maybe I mixed up the. Um, good point, um, Andrew. I might have mixed up the the Latin name. This one isn't Mexican tarragon. It's this one's called Mexican marigold. Mexican tarragon is also known as sweet mace. Shoot, let me double check now. Tajita's lucida might be Mexican tarragon, and this one might be the other, another one. Um, good, good point. I like how people are calling me out on my botany here. Oh no! Well, it looks like that's confusing. Um, I never thought of this one as um, Mexican tarragon, but it's possible that it is. I feel like this one is bigger. Let me see if I can find another. Um, botany can be confusing sometimes. Um, shoot. I might not get a full answer right now. This could be Tajidi's Liminoid. This might be Tajidi's Liminoid, in which case I would be, um, have put the wrong one on there. Oh, both Lindas are on here. Linda with a Y and Linda with an I. No, uh, good job, Andrew. Um, so there is some confusion sometimes with this is a good example. Um, some of the sometimes the common names are the same. The Latin names are different. This one could be Limini, not Lucida. And because I have seen the the one that's called Sweet Mace and Mexican Marigold also looks very different from this. So sometimes you know there could be two plants called Mexican Marigold and they have two different. They're actually two different species names, which is really confusing. Sometimes things have um, the same species names and two different common names. This one's definitely not sweet mace. Sweet mace um, smells like Coca-Cola to me. And this one just, this is like a good one if you wanna cover up like a bad smell in your car or your compost bin but um, it's not the, the Coca-Cola smell. Okay, so I've got these, I've got like three stages of zooming in. I'm gonna do one more stage of zooming in where I try to show one of these individual um, ray flowers. And I'm gonna do that, I think from the front here. Um, so let's see, ah, it fell. Oh, and look at that. I just made an accidental mark on my paper. Good thing I'm not being all precious about my page. Okay, so this one comes up like that. It has this cool thing like that, which is the stigma, I believe, which is the female receptive part that takes in the pollen and will eventually create the seed. Ah, oh, that didn't really show up very well in that drawing. Uh, maybe I'll have to do one outside of the circle here, which doesn't fit with my composition, but is important for learning. So finding the balance between, um, you know, having a good composition for your page, but also practicing the learning. Like if I need to draw this thing 10 times to learn about it, but that will mess up my composition. Well, which is more important to you, the learning or the composition? Uh, it's That's fine. Either one is fine is, is more important to you, but just to have that self-awareness and know when you have to make a decision, which is your priority. Okay. Whoa, and see, this. there's certain things that are just hard to draw no matter how you represent them. So I'm trying to draw this. I think I need to get a microscope that connects to my computer, but I'm trying to draw one of these individual flowers and it has this reproductive part, the female reproductive part. I tried drawing it two times Either of them came out great, but that's fine. I'll add yellow and fix everything. Add that saturated Hansa yellow light, and everything will be all right. Come in here. Sometimes that works, that you just add the color, and then people look at it, and they're like, oh, now I get it. But sometimes the color is not doesn't solve all your problems. So don't rely on it. 
Okay, now I'm going to bring in the green, and I'm going to use that same serpentine genuine while still a little bit wet, and just put that in here for the leaves. See, I'm not even coloring in between the lines, and it's fine. Okay, now maybe I'll just write a few things about what's the difference between Tajidis lucida and Tajidis liminoi. That's a good example of, um, so this is a really good example of where if you just use the more generic name, you know, like saying a sipiter instead of saying sharp chinned hawk, you wouldn't be uh, wrong. So if I just said Tajidis, I wouldn't be wrong. So knowing the more generic categories and uh, like if you don't know the difference between Homo erectus, Homo sapien, Homo sapien neanderthalensis, and you just say it's a hominid, uh, it's a it's a, a homo genus. You would be right. You would know that higher level of category. If you skip straight to the species level or the subspecies level or that more specific level, you might be wrong, or um, you know you might start having trouble observing other bits of information that are indicating that you're wrong. So knowing, for example, like. Um, like if you see a hawk and you say, I think it's a hawk or I think it's an occipiter, a more specific type of hawk and not jumping to the species level, then that gives you a little bit more information. And knowing plant families is super cool because you could travel to parts of the world you've never been in, see plants you've never seen before. And if you know it's Solanaceae, you know it's Asteraceae, that's super huge. And if you know something is... Um, to GDs, it doesn't, even if you don't know what species it is, just starting with, okay, I know it's to GDs. It's in the marigold genus. Um, and going with that can be super useful. Or cucurbita, this is a great example. This is in the cucurbita genus. I can't remember off the top of my head if it's cucurbita machata, cucurbita pepo, cucurbita mixta, cu cucurbita maxima. Uh, I know it's not maxima, but it's not cucurbita, um, what's the other one, ficofolia, but just knowing that it's the cucurbita genus, that already narrows it down, but I'm also not being wrong by over jumping to the specifics too soon. So I'm gonna just write a little bit on my paper here about that, because that kind of happened to me with the Nicotiana too. If you remember this woolly tobacco, Peruvian woolly tobacco, I couldn't remember the species name. I do know it's Nicotiana. So I'm just gonna write a little bit of sort of reflection and tap into that metacognitive part because metacognitive, self-aware um, aspects of thinking are super key to nature journaling and to life. So at the end of a page, doing a little bit of reflection on that will be really useful. So I'll switch to my document camera here and that'll be my last bit um, that I do for this episode. And so I'll just kind of uh, free associate a little bit about that question. General versus specific. That's what I'll, maybe I'll write a, a title, more of a title up in the top too while I'm at it. Um, window, I'm just gonna write window up here. window and then down here I'm going to write general Ooh, that looks like a fine is it GDs Tomentosa might be the name of that. I think Andrew said Tomentosa earlier um, for the, the Latin. That might be right for this, um, the, the tobacco. Is Tegides lucida or Liminoi? Is it in, so you can abbreviate Latin names, the genus always with just the letter. Is it in, um, Tomentosa, I think that might be right. That's sounding right now. Thank you, Andrew. Is it in Tomentosa? How often? So now I'm going to practice self-reflection. How often 
do I jump to an overly specific name? My handwriting is going to be bad because it's the bottom of the page, and the bottom of the page, your your hand's kind of falling off. So. If that's happening to you, if your handwriting or drawings get worse towards the bottom of the page, that's fine, especially when you're, you're nature journaling on the field and you don't have like a desk underneath you. How often do I jump to an overly specific name when I look at plants? Um, how does that, that matter? Like if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But does that affect like what I see? Hi, Emma. I'm glad you enjoyed the show. Um, uh, Suzanne, I'm glad you enjoyed the show also. Oh, it sounds like it's a dreary afternoon for you as well. How does that matter? How can I avoid that mistake, if that is a mistake. Um, how important are correct Latin names? I'm just gonna kind of ask a bunch of questions right now. How important are scientific names? How important are common names? And right now the other good thing too is this text is gonna add a nice uh, compositional element to this page. So if you just kind of look at the balance of this page having a whole bunch of text kind of in this size this is like the same size font I used in my metadata up here and having that same a chunk of that same size font down here I think will be useful um, how important are common names now maybe I can ask something about um, is Mexican marigold is the name Mexican marigold used for this big one and for the one called sweet mace, sweet mace, aka. Mexican tarragon. I've smelled the other one called Mexican tarragon before, and I would put that into like food maybe or drink, but this one, it's like, it smells good, but I would not put this into food. It's really, really strong. Oh, question mark. Okay. What else? Um, um, I, I could put something over here. I'm going to add a little note over here. Like I have never seen pollinators, even though this is like a yellow flower. A lot of people would be like, well, plant this for the pollinators. And it's a yellow flower. It's flowering during January. Uh, probably flat. It probably was flowering during December and it will probably be flowering during February, but I've never seen a pollinator go into this. So I'll just add that as a little side note. Never seen I should, I think I'm going to start saying flower visitors because just because you see a bug on a flower doesn't mean it's a pollinator. It could be doing other things on there. Never seen pollinators on this flower that I remember. Okay, I need a little more text at the bottom of this one. What should I write? Any ideas? Maybe I could write something recording how many brownies I ate. Um, oh, no. Drop.
drop my camera. Switch cameras, hurry. I had a camera accident. That's the problem. I fell out the window. All right. So I just need a few more lines here to complete this. But look how this page is coming out. Did it completely at my window, eating brownies, hanging out with all of you. So it's not that hard to do a nature journal page on a dreary Sunday afternoon from your window. I just need like three more lines here to complete that text and this will be a great page. I dropped my document camera out the window. Second story window, but it should be fine. And this nature journal page was worth it. Learn some stuff, unlearn some stuff. And I'm just gonna add like two more lines here and that'll complete it. So if I can do a nature journal page from my window, while balancing a squash on my head, that means that you can too. No excuses. It could be raining outside, it could be snowing outside. If you have a window, you have a pair of binoculars, you have a pen, a pencil, and a piece of paper, you can nature journal also. So thanks for joining in for this special episode of the Nature Journal Show Live. I'll be back on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time as usual. So if you enjoyed this episode, give it a thumbs up. And if you can't wait till next week, check out some of my other videos. I have a ton of videos, how-to videos, live interviews, nature journal adventures, all kinds of cool stuff. So thanks to all of you. I'm grateful. Um, ooh, compose a haiku. Yes, that is a great idea. Thanks to all of you. I can't tell which. That might be Linda with an I or Linda with a Y on Facebook. Suzanne, Andrew, Jose, Emma, Anetta, Mona, Abdullah. Um, all of you who joined in today, really appreciate you. And um, this video will be up for a while. And um, have a good rest of your Sunday. And remember, Sunday afternoon is the most depressed day in America. So don't let Sunday afternoon and evening be such a downer. You know, think about uh, good things that you can do. Um, practice gratitude. Remember all of the great things that you have, even the little things that you take for granted. And that will help you deal with the um, doldrums and that depressing uh, Sunday afternoon feeling. If you have to get back to work, get back to Zoom meetings uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, hang in there. I believe in you. Um, that was Linda in. Jose is still here. Gracias, Jose. Nos vemos. All right, everybody. Bye. Bye.